Good afternoon again, and welcome to the final session of the day. Um, that's absolutely no reflection on the speaker. It's just the order that, that they've, they've come in. I'm pleased to in introduce John Warburton, um, G4 IRN. Um, the World Radio Team Championship is held every four years and is, the, is considered to be the Olympic Games of radio contesting. Um, the um, most recent one was held in Bologna, Italy, um, ho um, where they hosted a total of 58 teams. Um, and um, John is going to describe his role as a referee in this and his experience of the week in Italy. And the, I'm right, I think I'm right in saying that the 2026 World Radio Team Championship is in the UK, is, is, it, is in the UK and they're just beginning to gear up for that now because it's such a, such a sort of ma major operation. Um, John's passion has always been for HF contesting and DXing, especially on CW. Over the years, he's completed many DX expeditions, operated from all over the world in the annual CQ Worldwide CW contest. He is a previous operator in the RSGB contest in the annual IAR UHF Championship, having visited the World uh, Radio Team Sport Championship in Germany five years ago he, to, to simply live the experience when the opportunity arose for him to be a referee at, at um, WRTC 22 in Italy. John was quick to apply and delighted to be selected. John. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> right, okay. So, um, I can't see anything, but that'll be fine. So, um, WRTC, World Radio Team Sport Championship. Um, I've, I've known a few people who've been involved in the previous events and um, never thought that I would be able to partake, at, certainly as a competitor, but net, yet alone a referee. Um, what I did was go to the Wittenberg um, event in Germany in 2018 just to see what it was all about and um, see how it works and that gave me a taste for it and then when the opportunity came up to apply for uh, being a referee in the WRTC in Italy 2022 which became 2023 event I applied and lo and behold they were looking for some new faces and um, I got selected to be a referee so happy days the now then, how do I advance? Do you advance the slide for me, Dominic? Or yeah. All right, I haven't done the course for this. Okay, so um, WRTC goes back to 1990 when it was first held in Seattle. I think, Dave, you were there. Uh, in those days, it was by invitation only. You didn't have to qualify as a competitor. It's always been, except for one year, a 100 watts contest with the... Um, the idea being to provide, these days, to provide a level playing fi field for competitors to compete on. Back in the Seattle days, I believe it was held in people's houses, the, there was no random call signs, so anonymity wasn't a thing. And, you know, it wasn't very equal, but obviously they got a taste for it. Uh, it was set up as part of the Goodwill Games that Ted Turner, the media mogul in the States in the 90s, uh, set up. Well, it, it was parallel to that. I don't think it was part of it. But it was so successful in Seattle that it was held again uh, several, a uh, couple of years, six years later in San Francisco. In San Francisco, they, they obviously picked up on this idea of making it more of an even playing field and certainly cutting down on cheerleading, calling from your friends uh, or home nation. And they had uh, random call signs uh, given out in San Francisco. In Slovenia, they leveled the playing field even more by ensuring antennas at the same, same antennas at the same height for each competitor. Um, Finland was the first um, event where they actually had a pseudo live feed from the stations to the central HQ. So they were able to monitor progress of all the teams. I say pseudo live. Being Finland, they gave every team a mobile phone and the referees had to text in every hour the scores of their team. Brazil 20, 2006 was the only one that wasn't 100 watts. I think it was 300 watts. Obviously, South America being further than North America or Europe, they felt that they needed the extra power. But Russia was a bit of a game changer because they provided tents in um, a, a, a region of Russia that is in a big flat area. They provided the same antenna, same mass, same car, same everything. 
And I think that was, is recognized as being the, the first that was truly equal for all stations to compete on. Then we had um, another one in the US. The one in Germany, again, that was done in tents, fairly uh, even. That was the one I went to. So it was very well organized. I could see when I got there, loads of volunteers there, running people around, collecting them from the station, from the airport. The, the, each of the stations needed antennas putting up, masts, someone sitting on site all weekend, filling up the generator, providing food, making sure the competitors were OK. And then the Italy one, which was scheduled to be 2022, actually 2023 because of world events, the qualification period for that for the competitors ran from 2019 uh, through to uh, 2021. The referees were asked to apply in 2022, which is when I applied with my CV. And I was told that uh, I had a, a, a place as a referee back end of 2022. The event happened in July 2023. So in Italy, there were 60 qualifying teams at the start, two dropped out actually due to political reasons. And um, although the, the first event in Seattle, they created a, a contest around the WRTC event, but after that and from San, San Francisco onwards, it's always been coincidental with the IARU HF Championship, which is the, the big contest in July when you have the IARU member societies like the RSGB uh, in on the contest and GR2HQ is the contest effort that the RSGB puts into this every year. Just to give you a bit of context around how WRTC works and is governed, there is a sanctioning committee. Basically the sanctioning committee are the gate holders to the, um, to the whole event. It's them who take, take applications for the now every four year uh, event. There'll be an organizing committee stood up for each of the events. So as there is one for the UK, there was one for Italy and Germany and so on. But essentially the organizing committee is responsible for everything about the event. So uh, making up the rules for the qualification for competitors, selecting the referees, the contracts, the finance, the sponsorship, getting the tents on the ground or otherwise accommodation that's required. Absolutely everything that you can see there is the responsibility of the organizing committee. And these things are big budget, especially when you've got 60 teams of two and 60 referees and then all the volunteers and so on. So I'll get on to being a referee in a, a little while, but just to give some more context, the WRTC in Italy, there was a qualification for the competitors over a couple of years, 20, 19, 2019 to 2021, so three years. Uh, there was 12 events over, uh, three, over those three years. The competitors had to enter or at least submit their highest scores for at least 12 of them. So there was a number of qualifying regions, the UK, uh, included Belgium, Ireland, Channel Islands, and Holland. So that qualifying region, the person who came top, as in all the other regions, could select a teammate, and the teammate had to have come in the top 10, I think, from um, any of the regions. So we did have a qualifier from this region, and he's sitting in the room, actually. So the 60 teams were selected the prior to the event and in fact it happened twice because there was a, a false start in 2022 there was a huge effort by the italians to put on a series of special event stations and in fact there was you may remember on the hf bands they were covered with these wrt wrtc suffix stations from all around the world there was 51 of them in england Ofcom being Ofcom, we couldn't have four letters at the end of a special event call. Uh, so we ended up with WC. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, uh, and that was great fun. I ran that, and they had an award scheme whereby the, the clock reset every day. So there was this frantic rush by all the participating um, or rather all the chasers, to contact the participating t uh, special event stations. 
and it was a, a lot of fun, some big pileups. But actually, and you can see there, it ran again after the false start just before the 2023 event, and there's one and a half million contacts on each event. They were, they were huge, hugely popular, huge events. And um, there was awards awarded at the final awards dinner for the people who came top in that. Uh, but actually, the reason, one of the reasons this was, a couple of reasons, this was run, these were run to raise awareness, but also they were testing the software because the Italians had quite innovative software that would pull in the QSO details from each of the sites with the logs in real time so that they could publish scoreboard, a scoreboard. But also, they were looking for what we call cheerleading. So they were looking for any irregularities in the logs as they were being uh, submitted in real time to check that there was no oddities, uh, stations from their home nation in particular contacting them. Um, uh, and any other irreg irregularities. So that was a good test for their software. Okay, so coming on specifically to the Bologna event, huge event, 700 people. And you can imagine when you've got an event that big, the logistical challenge that that might bring about. What they did was they found an event HQ uh, about 30 minutes southeast of Bologna in a place called Castel San Pietro Terme. Couldn't remember that one. But uh, it was, there was essentially three hotels and a conference center in a small complex in a rural area. It was quite a nice little market town. Obviously very old, a lot of history there. And it was ideal for this, really, because it had all the accommodation that was required. It had a central HQ hotel where uh, all the organizing team could operate from, not too far from the airport. And all the referees, competitors, visitors, and so on could stay locally. And the conference center there hosted the meetings that we had. OK. You can see there that the, the pictures, incidentally, are of the Italian team in the weeks prior to the contest. In the bottom there, storing the, the triband beams that were used there in each site. And at the top, boxes of stuff that was needed <laughs> at each site. Coax, rotor cable, rotors, networking kit, and so on. There's a lot of work to be done. And in fact, in terms of the, the, the UK effort, there's a lot of volunteers required who will be uh, much of the work we'll be doing this kind of stuff, building the stations um, and so on. I think I skipped one then. Have I gone the wrong way? That was it. Okay. So, just a few weeks, a month before the event, there was a bit of a cat catastrophe in that um, there was huge floods in the north of Italy, Italy, in the Bologna area. Uh, it was all over the news at the time. And this really did put the whole event in jeopardy. It wasn't certain at the time whether they would be able to run it or not. But they managed to pull it together. It meant these, these are the sites. The color denotes the region that the stations are in. These are the sites that they used. The l very light ones, so there's light gray, light blue, light red, are the sites that were flooded. And there was about 20 sites that they had to relocate. So it was quite an effort. And of course, each of these sites, they, they weren't in tents on this occasion and, and this event. They were in rural, largely in rural bed and breakfast type accommodations. So sort of country guest houses, if you like, where the antennas were put up, the masts were put up, the antennas were put up. So each of these would need negotiation by the organizing committee with the owners to get permission to not only for people to stay there, but to put the aerials up. And the aerials would need to be put up maybe in the week or so before the event. There was the cabling that needed bringing in. And this was done at every site, the, the same antennas. The, the competitors, they bring their own radio equipment, their own bandpass filters, their own switching, their own computers, their own power supplies everything else. So you can imagine if you're coming in from the US or South America, 
Asia even, it's quite a haul, quite a lot of stuff. And in fact, many of the Europeans drive there. So the event was on the same weekend as the IARU contest. But the, in terms of the people involved, it was uh, the one week, the, the Tuesday to Tuesday covering the weekend. So this, this, this was the timetable for the week. So everyone arrived on the Tuesday, which was the 4th of July. I flew in uh, from Manchester to Bologna. And on a, uh, there was a few other people at the airport as well who I met up with, who were up, some of whom are new. And actually, the Italian, one of the Italian volunteers I, I knew anyway. And um, there was a minibus ready to take us over to the hotel. On arrival, we all got a, a pack, a welcome pack, which the, the referee's T-shirts. We got three of these in orange. The competitors had yellow shirts. We got baseball caps, um, Yesu baseball caps. They get everywhere, don't they? And the um, a, a brochure and a pack for the week. So, uh, and some information about the, the, the region and the, the food around there. So we were shown off to our hotel rooms. And then there was a welcome dinner in the evening where everyone's getting to catch up with friends and meet new friends and so on, which was fun. During the week was very full on, to be honest. Most mornings were like eight, eight nine o'clock start and we'd go on, weren't eating till late, eight o'clock, I think. And there was one evening in particular when the food was very late. So the, the days were long and pretty full on, but on the Wednesday after arrival, there was a free day just for people to recover from their journeys. And they organized some day trips uh, on, on or yeah, a series of day trips were available through the week actually, but for the competitors and um, referees, really Wednesday was the only free day. I opted to go on a trip to the Marconi house, uh, which I'll come to in a minute on the next slide, but just quickly covering the rest of the week, we had meetings on the Thursday and then on the Friday, there was the site selection where the teams were allocated to their site. And I think we got the call signs on the Friday as well. Friday afternoon, we went off to the station where we were going to operate from, had dinner at the site QTH, and then the contest was Saturday and Sunday. So 12 Zulu to 12 Zulus, 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. In, in Italy. Then, I mean, it's a 24-hour contest. At the end of it, you're fairly knackered. Then back to base. Sunday evening is chilling out, early night. Then on Monday, the adjudication process takes place. And at the closing banquet on the Monday, the winners are announced. They dish out the awards for the special event station chasing that was going on before the event. And they also announced who is going to get the next WRTC which we know now to have been the UK. Then Monday, we'll go home and have a rest. So just going through that, on the Tuesday, I opted to go on the Marconi Museum visit, well, Marconi House, actually where Marconi lived with his family. I think an estate agent would call it a well-appointed house, <coughs> uh, top, top right. It's, they were obviously quite a wealthy family, but uh, Marconi himself, his mother was Irish and he spoke very good English. We actually heard a recording of him speaking and he had quite a plum English accent. Uh, this was the room on the bottom right where Marconi actually discovered radio. And just out of that window that you can see, he had a long wire antenna to a, a mast about 20 meters away. There's a, there is an Italian uh, permanent special event station that's hosted just by the house now. So that was really interesting, and obviously as a radio amateur, it feels quite spiritual as well to go, go back to the home of Marconi and where radio was first discovered. Then in the afternoon, we went to a museum in town which had all, all sorts of artifacts to do with radio and cinema and PCs and mobile phones and so on, and gramophones. There was all sorts of things there, so that was quite fascinating. There was about 50 of us on the trip. Um, there was other trips during the week I think the following Monday to the um, Lamborghini and the Ferrari factory, and there was also a regional food thing. Some of the tours were obviously aimed at the competitors' partners, the XYLs and so on. 
But as I said, I, I only went on this, this day trip. So, focus more on the, the referee. So really, the referee, and incidentally for the UK event, there will be an application process for referees to go into. So you can apply. Um, you, when you're with a team, the team that you're selected to be with, you're the eyes and ears of the other teams, making sure your team plays by the rule book, making sure that the station that they build aligns with the designs that are allowed. You're listening to the sta both the two stations operating at the same time on two different bands. They can be on sideband or CW. And in fact, in this contest, the Italian organizers have decided to give SSB contacts more points. They wanted to encourage people to use SSB. SSB is always hard with 100 watts in Europe in a contest. And whether that worked or not, I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, as a referee, I had to listen to both at the same time. Watching and looking at the, 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 their logbook, I had my own laptop and I could see what was being logged as they were logging it. So I'm making sure that what they're working is what's going in the log. I'm making sure that there's no irregular patterns of callers from their home country. I'm making sure that they don't identify themselves as being who, whoever they are. I'm making sure that the power doesn't go over 100 watts. So it's just making sure, basically, that they're playing by the rule book and um, that there's no irregularities. And, and actually, my team, who I'll come on to in a minute, they were fine. So on the Thursday was the first of the big meetings, and you can see there all the referees in their orange shirts and twice as many competitors in their yellow shirts. This was the first time everyone got together and there was, there was lots of questions about clarification of rules and you know, the exchange in this IARU contest is the IARU zone. And um, of course, you always get someone in a contest who gives you a CQ zone. So we're giving out my, the Italian, you know, in Italy, you're giving out zone 28. Um, and one of the questions was, well, what happens if they give you a CQ zone in return? Should you log what they give you? Or, and they said, no, log, log what it should have been. So it was questions like that that were coming up. The, uh, there's a diff there was a difference between um, the IARU rules and the WRTC rules. For any other competitor in the IARU contest, the multipliers were HQ, IARU HQ stations like uh, GR2HQ and TM0HQ and so on, so they all count as multipliers, plus the um, IARU officials re for it from each of the regions. And then the other multiplier for normal competitors in IARU is the I IARU zones, of which there's 70 odd. So addition of those two. For the WRTC competitors, the multipliers were the IARU HQ stations and officials, plus DXCC entities. I'm not sure why, but um, it was slightly different. So the WRTC guys were chasing as many DXCCs as possible, which was slightly at odds with the rest of the contest. So at that meeting, or uh, maybe in the afternoon on uh, Thursday, the referees were assigned to the teams. So this was the first point at which I found out who I would be aligned with. So for each of the teams, a referee name was pulled out of the hat. Now, it's pseudo-random in that I wouldn't have been assigned to the UK team um, or the French to the French team, etc. So there's obviously some uh, control in there to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I was pulled out with the Slovenian team. Uh, his, their call signs S53MM. Mattia and S57K, Sandy. Very nice guys. Uh, and obviously, once our pairing was done, I spent a bit of time with them and getting to know them. Uh, uh, when my team was assigned, I was given their, t their, their station design as well. So one of the roles of the referee is to make sure that when they eventually put it in on the Friday afternoon, that, it, that what they've done aligns with their proposed design, which has already been approved by the organizing committee. Then on the Friday, so 
things really start hutting up on the Friday because Friday afternoon you go off to site. What they do on the Friday morning for each of the sites, starting with the furthest one away, they pulled out the team that would go there. So that would give them a, an opportunity to set off first, it being the furthest site away. My, my team was pulled, or rather, yeah, my team was pulled out, I don't know, about 15th. I didn't have to wait too long. But uh, as soon as you, you pulled out, so I, we, we knew which site we were going to with my team, we then had to take a random, or, or take an envelope with a, with a call sign in it. I don't know how random it was, but uh, we didn't know what that call sign was. And I wasn't allowed to give that call sign to the team until 15 minutes before the contest. So there was one uh, final thing before, oh, just to give you an idea of the call signs that were being dished out, you may remember some of these if you took part in the contest. So I4 is the prefix for that part of Italy, the Bologna region, and they'd issued these special call signs for a period of 24 hours only for the duration of the contest, which the teams were using. They're very carefully selected to make sure that none of them end in E, I, S, H, yeah, for CW. And um, yeah, well, you can see them there. So there was some thought that went into what those call signs are. My team's call sign was I-42 Delta, Italy 42 Delta. So after we've got the um, site allocation and the call sign allocation, we have to meet up with the site manager and the referee has to collect his referee box. This Getting the referee box was probably the worst part of the organization of the whole event. There was a huge queue to get this box. I don't know why. They were just very slow on giving the boxes out. It was a bit disorganized. But we had to meet up with our site manager, who ordinarily would take us over to the site. But because my team had come in their own car to the event, uh, myself and, and the two, two of them, we went off in their car, which was great. So in the box I had to collect, mosquito spray, not, not needed in the end, uh, phone and charger. So the competitors' mobile phones, aren't, they, they aren't allowed to use them uh, or even have them during the contest. And I can keep my own mobile phone, but actually I decided not to keep it in the contest. I switched it off. But we're given a phone and charger, ready loaded with uh, numbers for the HQ in case of emergency of an, any technical failure, that kind of thing. Uh, and also a contact list in case we uh, couldn't use their phones in that respect. There was a VPN box that for some reason they hadn't already installed at the, uh, the, Q the site, the, the operating QTH, and some Ethernet cables to put that in. Also a little GPS control clock so that we could accurately determine when the contest was starting and ending, and then a, another copy of the diagram that I already had. So once we got the, the, the box, and we were with the site manager, and he knew where we were going, we were off to the site. And that was probably about mm, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that, I guess, when we got over there. And the first thing we, we did, actually, was just go out for lunch in a local restaurant, which was very nice. And they have pasta with everything. So I, you know, I've been to Italy before, but I hadn't really realized that really they do have pasta with everything. And even if you order chips, you'll have pasta before you have the chips. It's, yeah, interesting. So just a, a nod to some of the uh, British contingent that were uh, at the event. We had a representative team from the EU2 region, which was Dave G3NKC and Martin, who's now GW4XUM over here. Uh, there was a couple of youth teams that had um, Br British Isles, let's say, representation. So Jamie M0SDV with uh, his German colleague on one youth team and Megan EI5LA from the Republic of Ireland, who was on another youth team with also with a German partner. And then there was five of us who were uh, UK-based referees. Okay, so, and uh, that was the UK team with uh, their referee, Dale, CE2SV, V7SV. So then we went off to the QTH, which was about an hour's drive from uh, the HQ. Of course, when we 
got there, the team immediately think, right, what's the QTH like? Is it any good? Are there any noise sources? The place where we were was a, an old house. It was on the edge of a small town. Within a few hundred meters, there were some fairly new buildings, new, new homes, and there was a railway hmm, about a quarter of a mile away. So they, they immediately were suspicious about any noise emanating from the railway. Actually, it wasn't too bad, the site. There was some noise source from the house, and the fact that they had to beam north through the house, which of course, you know, most of the contest traffic is northwest or northeast, uh, was a bit upsetting for them, but they got on with it and they were fine. Some teams weren't so lucky. There was uh, one team, in fact, Jamie M0SDV and his partner ended up in essentially a greenhouse and it was about 50 degrees C. <laughs> and it wasn't very pleasant at all. There was another QTH. Actually, a couple of teams had to move because they weren't happy. I think noise sources uh, and fortunately, because a couple of teams had dropped out, uh, there was a couple of spare sites. There was another, I saw a picture from another team when we were back at HQ afterwards. The, the beam had fallen off the mast and was hanging sideways by the coax. So I don't know what went wrong there, but it obviously hadn't been put in very well. So. In terms of the site hardware, each, each of the sites, the volunteers in the weeks prior to the event install these antennas and the cabling, <laughs> all provided by sponsors, of course. And actually, UK have managed to, um, the UK Organising Committee for the 2026 event have managed to secure this, uh, all this gear, and it will be coming over soon. So not a bad, you know, and I think most people would be quite happy with this at home. It was. A, a good setup. The 40 meter dipole was a bit low, to be honest. It was about half the height of the 80 meter dipole, which was a bit on the low side. But the, the competitors were not allowed to touch this at all. So that was another one of my responsibilities was to make sure that they did not touch this. <coughs> the station and the station design. So what you see, the two pictures there are, are actual pictures of my team. What they set up. Uh, they brought everything that you can see there. So they were using FTDX 101s. So there's two of them there. They also brought a spare. Um, they brought a spare power supply, spare laptop. They brought monitors. On the picture bottom right, you can see the bandpass filters, the switching units, which allow them to uh, operate on the, the antenna as well. The tribander had a triplexer on it. So obviously two of them can use that at the same time and with appropriate bandpass filtering and switching, they can do that. The, the diagram on the left is there. A actually, that was the su a diagram suggested by the organizing committee for a station design. It wasn't their specific design, but they were very similar. What you have uh, in the, I don't know, about a quarter of the way down, the, the white box with the blue outline is the, the power detector. It was, it was a traffic light thing, red, amber, green. And if it went over 100 watts, it would become amber, I think over 110 red, something like that. And it was monitoring both transmitters at the same time. So it was my responsibility to monitor those traffic lights and make sure they never went over the green. In fact, they didn't. The, the 101s were on full power and they never, never tripped the power meter. The station was set up very much like a SO2R station, to be honest, but with two operators. The, in the bottom bit is the, the referee's hardware. So I brought my own laptop, plugged it into their network, and I could, they installed, they were using WriteLog for their logging software. So they installed that on my PC, and I was able to monitor what they were logging through the contest. I brought a pair of headphones and um, I brought a switch box. They provided me with an audio feed, and I brought a switch box so that, and I'll show you that in a minute, so that I could listen to one station uh, only, um, station A only, station B only, or both at the same time. The switch box, the, um, I, I know a lot of contesters use these small audio amplifiers. I just, I modified it with a socket at the back and a switch, a couple of switches, so that I could listen to either radio 
or both radios. Most of the time I listen to both at the same time. Uh, it, it's fairly easy, it's surprisingly easy, uh, easy actually if you're listening to two CW or one SSB, one uh, CW, because you kind of know what they're going to be sending or saying. So you can see what call signs they're logging and you know what the exchange should be. So if it, you're just really looking out for anything untoward. But believe me, going for 24 hours and just listening and not partaking is quite hard going. It really is. So 15 minutes before the contest, the, the, they're, they're allowed to play on their radios up until 15 minutes before the contest, so they can listen to band conditions, they can suss out what's going on where. Of course, the, prior to a big contest, the bands tend not to be too busy, but they kind of worked out where they were going to start. Uh, 15 minutes before the contest, I, we, we s turn the radios down, they get off the radios, we, I take their mobile phones off them. As I say, I also uh, took my mobile phone and put it in a cupboard because I, I didn't want to look at the live scores and sort of have any effect on them through knowing what the live scores might be. I gave them the envelope containing the, uh, their call sign and then they can set up their voice keys and macros and so on. And then only when the clock struck 12 Zulu were they allowed to go to their radio and start calling CQ. One guy, uh, one station set off on 20 meters SSB and the other station set off on 15 CW. Now, as part of the initiative to deter cheer cheerleading, or at least mitigate, the organizers decided to spot stations um, when they were calling CQ every third QSO. So when they're on a run on, on the same frequency, every third QSO. But actually the SSB guy soon found that no one was calling him. He wasn't having QSOs. So it wasn't even though SSB contacts had more points, on, only one more point I think, the, uh, per QSO, they decided fairly quickly that CW was the best way forward. Yeah, they, they had a few difficulties apart from SSB being challenging. There were some people just didn't get the call sign format. So Italy 42 Delta, th that's an impossible call sign. That can't be right. You know, a lot of people didn't realize that WRTC was going on and actually they'd issued special call signs. I mean, I know, I know that the call signs went out on the UK HF contest reflector fairly quickly. Uh, obviously didn't happen in other, in other places. There was, um, <laughs> I remember my team were called by a, a GM station. I don't know who it was, I can't remember. I didn't know him. And um, G GM, you know, it's a, a reasonable multiplier to get. They, they hadn't worked another on the other band, so they asked him to QSY after a QSO, and he said, oh no, you mustn't do that, that's against the rules. So he wasn't a, aware of the, the rules. So there was a few challenges. But we were kept fed through the contest. The, um, the host at the house was very good, producing pasta now and then, and uh, other finger food, which was which was good, and all the while, the scores were going through the VPN, or, or rather, the QSO data was going through the VPN, back to HQ for the for the scoreboard. The um, I suppose one thing I ought to say is you, you're not allowed to, as a referee, you're not allowed to help the team at all. But I did actually when they were unpacking and packing and that kind of thing, I just helped out. But during the contest, it's definitely hands off, and um, just just listening to them. So the contest went on for 24 hours. My team, I know this, the contest is about points and not number of QSOs, but my team were pleased to get to just over 4,000 contacts in that 24 hours, which with 100 watts is pretty good going, I think. Uh, it finished at uh, 2, 2 p.m. local, and then it was a case of stripping down the station and getting back in the car and the hours drive back to HQ and just relaxing after that. I think I had a few hours kip and then went out and joined up with some others and had a beer. And then um, Monday, they're adjudicating, <coughs> doing the log checks. They encouraged anyone who took part in the, the wider contest to submit their logs so that they could go into the comparison adjudication log crunching process. And then on the Monday evening, it was the big award ceremony 
when the winners were announced. A, a really nice um, part of the event for me was Marconi's daughter was dialed in and was put on a PA system. She's, I mean, she's old, she's, I think she's in her 90s, but it was really, again, like the visit to the Marconi mu Museum, it was quite moving because she was obviously, um, she, you know, she knew exactly what amateur radio was and ver it was very encouraging. M more pasta, prize giving. Uh, the, the winners were VE3, DZ, URI, and UW7LL. Now, I don't know the points, but just to give you an idea of the, the scale of their effort, they made 4,600 contacts. So my team came, I think, around uh, 30th, something like that. I hope I'm not doing them an, an injustice. Uh, but they were, you know, also rams, really. Um, but these guys made 4,600 contacts. All, all the logs and all the QSO stats are available on the Italian WRTC website. But for, for us, a big part of, uh, as in the UK, a big part of this evening, uh, the award ceremony was the announcement of the next event, and Mark M0DXR was there to announce that uh, the UK would host it. And he did a talk earlier today. So pictures there, top right is um, our English table at the dinner, at the award ceremony. And um, that was the award ceremony. And that kind of drew the event to a close. And there, there, I think there was a, a, a bit of a late night that night, just uh, celebrating and having a few beers, and then a few bleary eyes on Tuesday morning, making our way back home. But in terms of my memories, I mean, it was it was hard work all week, you know, up early, doing things, uh, late nights, and then of course 24 hours in the contest of concentration. So it was quite a knackering week. But you know, you take memories away from these events, and for me, it's definitely about the people, and whether it's the volunteers, the other referees, the competitors, the organising. You know, everyone's on a, a sort of equal level, really. You get to know everyone, and um, it's just one big festival of HF contesting, really. And if anyone's tempted to uh, uh, to apply to be a volunteer or a referee. Uh, or even try and qualify for the UK event, I'd say just do it. It's great, really, really great event. And of course, the other endearing memory was, of course, the, the food. <laughs> 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 okay, so there's a few web links which you can easily find on Google, but thanks for your time. If there's any questions, I'll happily take them. I assume the competitors no, took no breaks. I, I can hardly imagine you having to just stay awake for 24 hours without blinking. The competitors took no breaks, and the referee took no... Well, only, you know, uh, breaks of nature. Um, I, I actually went and got coffees and drinks for the guys, but they kept at it just for the 24 hours completely. Challenging. Question at the back here. This question, I mean, is certainly given that this last contest, I mean, obviously the, the Ukrainians were being cheerleaders. There's no doubt about that, really, is there? Well, and the winners? Yeah. I mean, it just happened to be Ukraine. They had to get 400,000 points more than everyone so else. So the UW3DZ is a Ukrainian, and he lives in Canada. Yeah. So he's, he wasn't representing the Ukrainian region. The, the organisers went to great extent to look at the logs and ensure that they were doing their best to make sure there was no cheerleading. So I, you I, mean, you, I mean, people in Eastern Europe are going to know a Ukrainian accent, aren't they? He speaks more with an American-Canadian accent, to be honest. His, right. his, his pal, um, UW, I forget his call sign, uh, I don't know what his accent is. Yeah, OK. Is there, sort of, is there a temptation to sort of move away from SSB to, say, FT4? No. Or Ritty or something <laughs> <like> that. <laughs> no. no. But that way you couldn't, you wouldn't know, you, would, you definitely wouldn't know. No. It's you? Uh, uh, that yeah. yeah, I mean, CW was a, is a better mode to use anyway, because it yeah. takes away. But uh, no, it won't be going to any of the data modes. But uh, 
you know, the organizers did their best to make sure that there was no cheerleading, and if they'd identified anything, they would have called it out. Yeah. You're not suspicious of the result? No. No, no okay, all right. The logs, the logs are there. If you want to have a look, the logs are online. Run them through a yeah. spreadsheet and But, but see. would Mr. and Mrs. Lithuania not work, just, just work Ukraine and not work anyone else, or maybe a few others and... They're, they're looking for that in the and you they know when when they do the when they do the log crunching they're looking for that and it, they can find that oh easy. yeah yeah they've okay. got quite sophisticated software yeah okay all right all right fair enough yeah <laughs> no I, un I understand your <laughs> you know I understand where you're coming from but hi John hi um, Mark M zero K Y B hi um, what advice would you give to somebody in the UK who is perhaps thinking of qualifying or applying as a as a referee? Do it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> do but it. Be, but beyond that, what what do, from what you've seen, uh, the two people who who competed, you know, what 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 does it other than obviously getting sufficient points? What what does it take? What does it take to 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 become to be successful at okay. at WRTC? As a, as a referee or, or a competitor? Okay. Well, as a referee, I don't know what they're looking for exactly, but I can give you my profile because <laughs> I, I got selected. I think, they would, I think they were looking for new faces anyway, but I'm, I'm mainly a CW contester, to be honest, so that makes me competent at reading Morse code. And uh, as a referee, you have to be able to read Morse code. You need to be able to understand what they're sending. M most of that will be certainly 30 words a minute plus, so you need to be reasonably competent, uh, you know, you need to be able to read those kind of speeds. And in fact, in the rules, it, I remember it said that the CW exchangers, you know, the 59928 bit, must not be sent at more than 50 words a minute. So that kind of gives you, <laughs> no one sent it that fast, I'm sure, no one sent it that fast. But certainly 35 words a minute, you know, is not unusual. So you need that. Um, I mean, I've... I, I think it helps if you're known to some of the organizing committee already. Uh, and I, I do know some of the organizing committee and some of the sanctioning committee. And I, I know a number of past competitors. So I think that helps, the fact that they know who you are and you know, the chemistry is right and the relationships can be fine. The, you need experience in contesting world. And all the obligations that 